Gravesend Cold War Bunker in North Kent lies unsuspectingly buried under Woodlands Park. It was built for local council to coordinate an emergency civil defence response to an attack on Britain by the Soviet Union. We were fortunate enough to be given exclusive access to this fully furnished, unique remnant of the country's uneasy past. Hi guys, it's our first explore of 2020 and we're back in Gravesend today with Jay Curtis who last showed us around New Tavern Fort here in the county. But today we're underground again and we are in the Gravesend Cold War bunker. We are, so Jay's from Thames Defence Heritage and has been kind enough to open the bunker up uh, for us especially and show us this place. It's an amazing uh, piece of history, it's been completely refurnished with period accurate bits and pieces. So Jane, if you don't mind just telling us a bit about the bunker. Well hi guys, nice to see you again. Um, yes, we are in Gravesend's Cold War Bunker. It's actually a civil defence control centre. It was built in 1954, so it was going to carry on the work of the civil defence as they did in World War II, organising uh, rescue teams, demolition parties and all that sort of thing. Uh, it was decommissioned in 1968 when it would have been replaced uh, in the basement of the Civic Centre. It's a purpose-built structure, built under the park that's here, which makes it quite unique as they normally are converted basements. That's great. Let's go and have a little look, yep. see what is in store for us. So when you come into a bunker, you expect there to be a pretty thick blast door here, but of course there's not. It's just a wooden door. Fairly thick, but I mean, if there was any sort of blast, whether it's a nuclear one or you know, a grenade thrown down here, this isn't going to offer much protection, I don't think. But anyway, the first room that you get to is the generator room, which is where Jay joins us. Jay, it all looks fairly sort of complex in there. It is, yes. Uh, yes, most of the original features are in here, apart from the actual uh, diesel generator, which left after the bunker was uh, out of use. You mentioned the blast doors, or lack of blast doors I should say. You are right, there is no proper blast door there. These are the kind of doors that are really fitted. You can see that from the sort of airlock facility on them there. Also, of course, we've got no decontamination facilities that you might expect if you come into what we're calling a nuclear bunker. Um, if we look in our plant room, we have got uh, all the duct in the thing that runs around all the bunker. So of course this would bring in your air from the outside. It would uh, go through sort of like a filter system and then be pumped around the bunker. Uh, remember the era we're talking about, 1954 to 1968. Not only are you supplying clean air fresh from the decontaminants outside of here, of course everybody that's in here is going to be smoking. Cigars, cigarettes and everything, like there might be no tomorrow, of course there might not have been a tomorrow. <laughs> so the idea that we forget now of everybody in some of this container this all smoking away would have definitely gone on there. Filtration system as it is there still all runs today. And it's all original, isn't it? It is, it is. The wiring has all been replaced so that she still runs 65 years on. And I could fire that up for you now. That'd be great. Pretty incredible, but it still works. 65 years on and just like that it fires up. After an initial walk around the bunker, it became clear how underprepared it would have been against a nuclear conflict, having more in common with an air raid shelter from the previous war than anything that came after. So we're here in a storeroom in the bunker, and a lot of the bits and pieces in here, again, they all sort of date from World War II era or World War II technology. Not much has really changed, considering that warfare at the time had developed a lot in the space of about 10 years. Uh, we've got a lot of tin helmets, um, probably reserves left over from 
World War II, we've got gas masks, um, we've got um, stretchers over here for any casualties, and all this is sort of here waiting to be used in the event of an exercise or obviously um, an actual nuclear or conventional war with the Soviet Union. So we all know the sound that an air raid siren makes and this is what one actually looks like. They would have been used in the Second World War to warn people if you know, the area was going to be under attack and a similar thing in the Cold War if any sort of incident was to unfold. This is the noise that you'd hear and I'm going to give it a go. Sure, <laughs> that could have gone an awful lot louder, but it's quite amazing just to be able to, you know, hear that sound just by pulling a lever effectively. We then proceeded to take a wander through the relatively compact bunker's many rooms. We first began in a messenger's room, where personnel arriving at the centre from the chaos outside would have relayed their messages and information to the staff here. Next we visited the women's dormitory, consisting of only a pair of bunk beds for the 10 to 20 women that would have been working here. It is believed they would have worked in shifts and only a few would have been resting at one time. Conditions would have been cramped and offered little privacy. The far half of the corridor adjoined the men's accommodation and a room for the liaison officer with similarly basic bedding. There would have been around 40 individuals working in the bunker at one time. It is clear that the setup was designed to be temporary, with no actual food preparation facilities being initially incorporated, with toilets primarily consisting of Elson chemical toilets, again characteristic of shelters in the Second World War. Today, there is a second bunker here, contemporary to the early Cold War. This is a recreated Royal Observer Corps observation post. Now, yeah, Jay, we've been in many uh, RIC posts before, but never one in a Cold War bunker. <laughs> well, no, of course, it wouldn't actually be here. Um, what you see in this room is a, a recreation of Post 15, which was who? Uh, we were very, very lucky at the time that the RIC posts were being decommissioned and sold off and such like, but everything that was in Post 15 at who? was brought into this room, which, as you guys know, is about the right size for an RSC post. So it, it is a very, very good representation of RSC post. All the documents and everything you see here, they all came from this post. And uh, we used to have two of my fellow volunteers here were actually stationed in that very post. So this is the documents and equipment that they used. So there it is there, post 15. Um, it is the only real hard part on the tour that we do here with the public, is just getting across to them that there could be an actual bunker the size of this, and as you guys know, dotted all about the place. We visited many ROC posts which still line the countryside in an abandoned state, but it's great to see an example with its furnishings in their original condition. Next we visited an emergency services room where representatives from the police, fire service and civil defence corps would have worked. So as has become somewhat of a tradition, we do like to get the, get the outfits going. 
Um, here we've got the outfit of a Civil Defence Corps warden in the event of an air raid. Probably much the same as what would have been worn in World War II, but by the Cold War that may have involved um, air raids from nuclear bombs. And here I've got a tin Tommy helmet here with the W on it. Um, we've got the badge there and I've also got the armband um, and this jacket here apart from the trousers it's all fairly authentic to the time and um, civil defence wardens they may have been coming into the bunker to get this equipment um, that could have been stored in here they may have been reporting messages about what was going on outside which is where they'd be primarily be working um, but there would have been civil defence wardens in close contact with the bunker In the centre of the bunker is a larger communications room, linked up to telephones where talks with officials further afield would have been conducted. So some of the leaflets and bits in the bunker today, they're all original from the time. This one here's from 1952. And this is a civil defense basic training manual and it's all about the effects of nuclear bombs in the 50s or what might have happened to Britain, uh, Gravesend more specifically. Here we've got some images of various buildings damaged by explosions, radiation. A lot of the images are actually from Hiroshima and Nagasaki because at the time that was the only example they had of the effects of nuclear strikes. Finally we looked at the district control room where the crucial response to an attack would be planned. Here, resources would have been allocated across the area for first aid, supplies and fire services. Reports of blasts across the county, including by ROC posts, would help assess the extent of damage so that a course of action could be decided. So in the case of a nuclear attack on England, rather than using sophisticated computers and things that we might expect to have today, what would be used to calculate the damage was simply this, a cardboard um, spinner basically, um, and it's got all kinds of different values all written around it. So we've got like the power of the nuclear weapon, we've got things like, you know, um, how the height of the burst, um, the kinds of soil that it landed in and then also the different damage reported in the area that the blast has been reported so we've got things like damage to glass and tiles if your window smashed probably wasn't a big deal um, but over at the other end you've got damage to houses and debris you're going to end up being able to see how many casualties would have potentially resulted from that and this is the way that councils would have been able to assess the damage from a nuclear strike whilst it was going on down here in the bunker. So I think that's going to conclude our tour of Gravesend Cold War Bunker. It's been amazing to see the place, um, to get a feel for what it would have been like to be down here back in the early Cold War. 
um, and also quite harrowing really to think how little protection and space was offered to the people that would essentially be down here for their final days perhaps. So yeah, thanks for Jay for showing us around. Hopefully next time we'll be exploring with Jay across the river in Essex. But until then, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, check out this place. They've got their own Facebook page. The link is below.